Hi, and welcome to The Existential Coach. Today I want to talk about complexity. Now, right off the top, that might not sound very appealing. Why are we talking about complexity? I want my life to be simpler. And by complexity, really what I mean is holism. And I'm going to use those words synonymously throughout this podcast. Now, why am I doing this? Why am I talking about complexity? Why am I talking about holism? Well, one of the things that seems to be present in our day-to-day lives is the notion that we have to reduce or get rid of things. And we tend to move towards, or can tend towards, move towards a reductionist view. So we say, well, it's efficiency or it's uh, common sense or whatever it is that we say. But in effect, what we're doing is we're reducing or eliminating the complexity, the holism. So this comes out in a variety of different ways. We see this, of course, in racism. We see this, of course, in sexism, where the um, fear of of status, loss of uh, people taking jobs, status, positions, and all the rest of it are really too complex for us to handle within our system of thinking. So what we do is we think, well, we want a simpler originalist idea. And we pick some point in time, some imaginary point in time, where everything worked, where everything seemed to be, um, you know, harmonized or a, a kind of utopia. And because we genuinely feel anxiety, we genuinely feel fear because there is this increased complexity going on, this increased awareness going on. We feel quite right that we should, you know, pull back and get to fundamentals, get back to basics. And it's an argument that can be quite persuasive until you look at the argument. And so in this podcast, as we think about complexity and we think about holism, we might notice that many of the things that we want to get back to um, reduce our experience in the world, our, our being in the world, that actually confine us in many ways. So let's take, for example, feminism. Now, I've had discussions with a number of people over the past couple of years about feminism, and one of the things that struck me about those conversations is their perception of the term has been entirely constructed by um, by their by influences that really have nothing to do with what, if you opened up the dictionary, what you would find uh, as the dictionary definition of feminism. So let's do that. Let's look at the dictionary definition of feminism. Okay, so this is the um, the dictionary definition of fem- feminism. Um, and noun, uh, the advocacy of women's rights on the ground of equality of the sexes. The issue of rights for women first became prominent during the French and American revolutions in the late 18th century. In Britain, it was not until the emergence of the suffrage movement in the late 19th century that there was significant political change. A second wave of feminism arose in the 1960s with an emphasis on unity and sisterhood. Seminal figures include Betty Friedman, Germaine Greer. A third wave was identified in the late 80s and 90s as a reaction against the perceived lack of focus on class and race issues in earlier movements. So, and that's from the, uh, what's this, the Oxford... Yeah, this is the Oxford Online Dictionary, or the, the app you can buy. So, this is what feminism is. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about feminism. And yet, what I'll hear people say is, well, feminism is man-hating. Again, you can say, well, you know, you're just taking a narrow example. People have their perceptions of things. Ideas change over time. If, you know, Jordan, you're talking about complexity. So, if we're talking about complexity, certainly amendments can be made to the Oxford Dictionary. And the way people operationalize the term feminism can be to hate men. Well, let's explore hating men for a second. Let's just explore it and see what do we find when we say, okay, there are some women who hate men. First thing, are women allowed to hate men? Well, it's kind of a catch-22. If they have equality, then of course, if a man hates a woman or a woman hates a man, you start getting into this question of, well... Does the person have the right to say no to a man? Does the person have a right to say, I hate that man? Does the person have a right to say, I think what that man is doing is stupid. I think what that man is doing is utterly and completely insane. 
does a woman have that right? When a man, or a woman for that matter, obfuscates on that point, they are effectively, effectively buying into a way of understanding the world, which says that's actually not a place that the woman has. And this is what I mean by complexity, holism. That there's a way of looking at our relationships and the power dynamic of those relationships that constitute a way of being in the world that in and of itself mitigates what we can and can't say. And in so doing, constructs a reality that avoids complexity, i.e. equality, equity, and so on, in favor of some originalist type notion, albeit totally unclear and largely incomprehensible, um, and certainly incoherent, that enables that belief as a way out of complexity, as a way out of holism. So I'm going to focus in this podcast on feminism as the example, just because it seems to be coming up again and again and again. And it, there doesn't seem to be this real understanding that we're talking about equality, period. And if we do not have a system in place that can facilitate the kind of linguistic understanding of what equality, what equity is, then does that say something about women or does that say something about the system itself? In other words, the system is structured in a way to take away or to mitigate the freedom and agency of, in this case, women. And if they challenge that because the system is so indicative of this power dynamic, they are then, well, hating men. And I've heard lots of women say, well, you know, it was not that feminists hate men. And I think, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't some women hate some men? Why wouldn't some men hate some women? Lots of people hate people. Now, yes, I think it's problematic to get ourselves to that position to say I hate. And when I was growing up, my father always said, you know, don't say hate, say dislike. And I think it was his way of trying to mitigate and bring a little bit more awareness to the notion of hating is pretty big, right? You're, you're really closing a lot off. Saying your dislike, saying that you don't like their behavior, you don't like the way they're, they're acting, you don't like their thought process, can start to differentiate the problem from the person. And so, fair enough. If we say that the, the woman or the man who's in this dynamic, bouncing the word hate back and forth, may not ultimately end up in a position where they can really hear or understand each other, certainly I think that's a, that's a relevant point. Yet, I think beneath that, what's really striking to me is that there is no apprehension on the part of the man to say, well, I'm not interested in feminism because it's about hating men. And to not recognize the epistemological construct that is necessary for them to say that, which is, a woman does not have the right to hate a man. That's really what I'm challenging. So beside the semantic of, of the word hate, which, as I say, that's a separate point, and I think that could be handled separately, just having the right to hate, that's the question, and that's the point I want to drill down on. Because if we are increasing our complexity, if we are increasing our holistic perspective, then it is going to include more complex emotions, including things like hate. And it'll go further. It'll include hating one moment and loving the next. It'll include all of these complex interwoven dynamics that don't actually operate in the simplistic reductionist way that we are purporting to be the right way. So if we are to develop a deeper understanding, move beyond these kinds of boundaries and barriers, beyond a system that has a very specific notion of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, then we have to embrace a complexity that has an equity and equality of language. So now, I'll take a breath here, because this has been a bit of a, a bit of a ramble, a bit of a rant. And I'll go back to the beginning of the podcast. And this idea of complexity, because I think what often happens in discussions is we kind of default to this notion that if things could be simpler, everything would be okay. Now, there's a cognitive, like from a neuroscience perspective, there's a cognitive need to do things that uses less energy. Um, it's, there's a survival aspect to this, right? You're, you can have habits which take far less energy or cognitive power 
and so and therefore you can survive longer, right? You're you're using less fuel, so to speak. However, using less fuel and 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 going with the habits, the conventions, means that we start to um, construct our lives based upon the habits, and that flies in the face that flies in the face of what I was talking about with complexity, or holism. If we are going to um, increase, evolve, develop, whatever you want to call it, then we are going to transcend and include, to, to quote, um, amongst others, Ken Wilber. And this notion of transcend and include means that we are taking what we've learned and or experienced, and then we are that becomes a part of, and we keep on moving forward. So one of the, the challenges we face is that involves a use of cognitive energy. In other words, we have to really dig into it. We have to really think about these things. We have to embrace the uncomfortable. We have to be with things that are confusing, upsetting, nonsensical even. Yet if we are unable to do that, if we are unable to be with the uncomfortable, then we are trapped in a way of existing in the world that actually excludes our deeper understanding of what it means to be, in the case of feminism, equal. So turning back to the feminist uh, example now and the notion of a a man, a woman, sorry, not having a right to to say, I hate a man. Well, that raises questions about who constitutes rights, who defines. Clearly in that situation, it's the man, right? The, The man is deciding that she's not allowed to do that. And this is referred to as a form of entitlement. And we see that, of course... In any system that has um, a default or a habitual, and that's where this idea of the habitual way of existing comes into play, that the man is operating in a state of habitual thought, which other people resonate with, because it's a simpler, right? It's, it's the way it's been. You don't need to actually think to believe it. It can be a de facto belief. You're not challenging it. You're just accepting it. Now, what this means, and what's so dangerous about this, is you're not actually thinking, right? The The, the man who says, well... You know, I'm not interested in feminism because feminism is about hating men, is just being lazy, right? They're, they're in a cognitive sense, they're just not being engaged. They're not being, you could say, strong, or you could you could say intentful, you can say whatever, you know, whatever however you want to describe it. They're defaulting to some originalist kind of notion that they've constructed, right? Of of this is, you know, the natural order of things or whatever they've kind of fantasized as being this original picture of the relationship between man and woman. But what's significant about it is it's constituted within a very specific modality of power. Now, why does this matter, right? Why can't, because somebody might say, well, why can't we just have a very specific kind of power dynamic between, in this case, men and women? And why can't we just go on for millennia like that? Well, in, in a way... The, the person who says that is saying, why? I mean, I remember there's a kids in the hall skit years ago and a character comes on and says, you know, why can't everybody learn English? I did. And it's this presumption that comes from our own belief set that why can't people just do what I want the way I want, which is to say, why can't they do the thing that I feel the most at ease with? that I feel the least challenged, that I feel the most comfortable with, why can't they just do that? Is that really a way of looking at our lives? And I'm I'm saying our in the holistic sense. And that's why complexity and holism start to really connect here. I think in a more obvious way, which is to say, yes, there's increased complexity because there's the ways in which individuals are dealing with things, different cultures, genders, and so on. And of course, you can get in a spectrum. You can look at the gender uh, across the spectrum and so on. But what's, what's happening is there's increased complexity. But if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And so by looking at each and every problem as, well, let's just get rid of the complexity, get back to the habitual way that I have of understanding myself, of understanding the way I exist in the world, then we cannot progress. So what happens when a person does that? Are they actually happy? Well, this becomes this kind of catch-22 situation, right? The idea is you need to have power over other people to feel like you are somebody, right? You, If you're a man, you have a power over a woman, and you can say, well, I feel good about that. Obviously not consciously or perhaps consciously. Um, but you are now in a very contingent situation, which means 
you don't actually have any agency, right? You are existing within a system that is structured a power dynamic that you were just born into. You are actually not a participant in this. You are just a subject of this way of being in the world. Now, and that's very much what happens when we are constituted as, as Dasan, being in the world, how we are with ourselves, how we are with others. And that be thrown in this, that, that is to say, there's a conception that we have of the world that is projected. We've learned it and it's projected into the world and everything operates within that construction. If we are to free ourselves from that, then we need to break down that way of thinking. We need to transcend it and include to move to a different way, a more complex way, a more holistic way of understanding our situation. And in so doing, we free ourselves from the paradox of power, which is you are in a position always where you need to have control over somebody else to have some sense of self. And that's a form of codependence. And so what we get into here is equality is about people being equal. And if your only identity comes from being unequal or unequal, then you are paralyzed by this experience because you need to oppress people in order for you to feel like somebody, which means, and this is the real question here, who are you? Who are you if you need to have power over somebody else? I don't know who that is. I don't understand. I don't understand who that person is. They're just somebody who needs what more power, more contempt, more control, more certitude, more bravado, more whatever it is, they just need more and more and more and more and more because what? Where does it end? So, you know, going back to this idea of, of complexity, if we can start to say, okay, well, I'm a man and, uh, and um, I, I'm, my status has changed, right? I'm, you know, I grew up in an environment, let's say, where jobs were given to me as a white male, um, and I received them, and it was relatively speaking easy. And that starts to change for whatever reason. Well, one of the assumptions is, well, I'm really capable, and I'm really this, and I'm really that, and now they're being taken away from me. But here's the real, you know, the real kind of bite you in the ass kind of thing here is that actually you are never capable. You were never the best choice for the job. You were never better than anybody else. You were actually never any of those things. The power that you thought you had, you actually never had. All that happened is you existed in a system that favored you. That's it. The power that you thought you had, the control that you thought you had, it never existed. It was a, a fallacy of the structure that kept you going and believing and operating within that structure. But it was never actually yours. And we know this is the case because as it starts to wane and change, you panic and realize, oh, it's not actually in me. Oh my God, who am I? And so equality then becomes a threat because unconsciously we're operating as men in the situation whereby we think, okay, I have this inherent you know, status, this inherent value. And I certainly know this comes up in the film business in particular, where I'll talk to actors or, or filmmakers who are white and they'll say, well, you know, there's these opportunities for non-white people. And, you know, I feel like I'm being overlooked and, you know, I'm a good actor. And I say, well, yeah, but it was never about you being a good actor or a good writer or a good director, right? It was, it was about entitlement. And whether that switches now for whatever reason, we still haven't dealt with the actual system, which is the system itself is structured in a way to oppress, to to simplify the complexity of intersectionality, of gender, the spectrum of gender, and so on and so forth. So what I'm arguing for here is a deeper understanding of the way in which complexity is actually an opportunity, a potential to go into unknown or uncharted territory of existence. And I don't know where that will lead. But what I can say is, if somebody says feminism has to do with hating men and doesn't even look at the dictionary, it says that the lack of awareness and coherence is so profound that we're not even willing to do the most fundamental of, of investigation. And if we're not willing to do that, then doesn't that actually prove that all of our power is based on entitlement? Because you don't need to learn about something if you're entitled. If, 
if you're not an entitled person, you educate yourself. You learn about it. You ask questions. You talk to people. You get a sense of what their experiences are. You, you explore it. But if you're entitled, you don't need to do that. In fact, the very notion of opening up the dictionary and looking up the word feminism is in some way beneath you because you think, well, I shouldn't have to do that. I have my view of what that is. I have my... Um, my, my opinions, my truth, my, or what's referred to as truthiness about that, and that's fine. You have your truth and I have mine. But that's only possible within a structure of entitlement. Once you remove, fully remove that system, you only have awareness that is shared and you develop ideas and arguments and you collaborate with people and so on and so forth. And you do that based upon equality and equity. But if you don't do that, if you are so habitually bound to a form of entitlement that doesn't allow you to actually explore because you think the act of exploring itself is a vulnerability that you should not have to face, then you are trapped. You are not a person with power. You are not a person with agency. You are not a person who is exploring the uncertainty, the complexity, the chaos. And from this chaos emerges something. The, 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 the universal womb, so to speak, that ideas and concepts and potential and new relationships and all sorts of invigorating and exciting things start to emerge. So by saying and reducing the notion that, okay, well, feminism is about this thing, which clearly it's not, all you've done is said, you don't know how to look and face the complexity of life. Now, if that's the case, what do you do? How do you face this complexity? How do you face this uncertainty? It's not an easy question. And, and it is a humbling question. Because in that, you realize there's a vulnerability about your experience. That the things that maybe you've had weren't really you. That the status and the opportunity, you were born into that. The color of your skin, the place, um, the, the country you're born into, the time in history, and so on and so forth. These were things that happened to you. They weren't some great act of brilliance on your part. They were chance. And to start to recognize that the, the experiences that you've had and the opportunities that you've had are to a great extent because of chance is, is a humbling process because you quickly then think, well, what about the people who weren't lucky? Right? What, if, what if I had been born in another country or another time or whatever it was? So, for example, for me personally, you know, I dropped out of high school and I struggled with school and learning was a really difficult, it, learning in a school context was a very difficult thing for me. Now, later on in life, in my 20s, I got a computer and that opened up a door. It had a spell check on it. I could look words up easily. I could start to write and fix my writing pretty easily because it's a word processor so I could go back and edit. I got into reading and exploring things. So... I started to find ways to learn about how I exist in the world and to face my, my arrogance, to face my finite nature that I will die. started to learn about my pride and, and how that could usurp me. started to learn about my pain, my sense of uncertainty. started to learn about all of these different dimensions of myself. And that became this very fertile ground to understand how, well, entitlement for one, but more broadly, how the constructs of society are so habitual and that I was responding, them, responding to them in different ways. And many of them were negative. So even like I shared about this idea of going to school and struggling with school, what's interesting is school was a very specific way of learning. In other words, that kind of learning had value, whereas the other kind of learning that I felt more intuitive with, not the, I should say, an other kind of learning, um, was not. So as I started to trust, and here's the big underlying point, as I started to trust the complexity, as I started to trust the holism that, yes, I may not have fit into that world, the school world in the, in the way that others did, I did fit somewhere. And I fit somewhere if I expanded my view, if I started to embrace the complexity, if I started to embrace the holism. So there is a... Um, a liberation that comes from embracing the complexity, from, from seeing holistically or viewing this holistically, that there are many ways to understand ourselves, that we do not need to understand ourselves in one single way. And if we only have that one way of understanding ourselves, the, the, 
the weakness we have is we then have to do everything we can to hold on to that. We have to do everything to hold on to that mode of identity because we think without that we don't exist. And so when somebody says, I don't like feminism because feminism is about hating men. As I've already pointed out, if a woman hates a man, that's up to her. I don't have a choice over who people do or don't hate. I can certainly say I've talked to many women, and if I was a woman in their situation, I would definitely be hateful of some men, angry at some men. So I can understand that feeling. I can completely, at least as an outsider, understand that why wouldn't you be frustrated? You know, when somebody has shunned you simply because, not simply, but only because you're a woman. And I think not hearing somebody is the most unnatural thing to do. And it gets back to this idea of complexity. So this is back up and and look at it from the perspective of, here's this guy who says, well, I, you know, says to a woman, you know, I'm not into feminism because feminism is about, you know, hating men. And how... How big is that person's world? Where are they coming from? How much can they create? How much can they understand? Well, not very much. So if we are going to progress and if we're going to evolve and and, and our understanding and and so on is going to deepen, and yet we are not willing to challenge our own thoughts, if if we're not willing to challenge our own thoughts, then what are we willing to challenge? We need to make the world kind of go with us. I mean, I've said this before, but it's almost as if we think it's easier to change the world than to change ourselves. And, and I think this idea of how we get locked in to a way of thinking is, um, is fed by this notion that you shouldn't have to change. You will change, whether it's just by dying, just by aging, whatever it is, you will, the, the cat's out of the bag on that one, the jig is up, you will change. So how will you face that change? And here's, you know, kind of the clincher. Can you face that change? Will you be a participant? Will you face your anxieties? Will you face your fear? That to me is the strength. That to me is the sense that, okay, I'm not going to hold contempt towards somebody else. I'm not going to say, you know, feminism is about um, uh, being a man hater. What I'm going to say is I want to be in a society that values equality. Because that opens up so many more opportunities for me. That opens up so many more, um, so much more complexity for my experience. Because I can have different kinds, different qualities, different nuances to these relationships. And in doing that, I get to expand beyond my habits. So if there's one takeaway here, in my mind anyway, it's this notion that by expanding into the complexity, by expanding into this holistic way, we actually start to shatter the habits which liberate us from a construct which actually is not giving us the identity we think it is. And we know that, as I said before, because as it starts to fall away, we start to panic. Which makes me think, what are we beyond that form of understanding our identity? What are we beyond that kind of codependent understanding of existence? Can we challenge these things and look within ourselves and in that find a strength and an insight and a wisdom? So, as I come to the end of this and I slow down, I must say, it's been pretty obvious, I get a little riled up by this. And I hope it hasn't come across as being too confrontational, but I I hope my tone and, and what I was striving for is to create a kind of momentum in your thinking. Because certainly I find that when I start to really think about things and allow myself to flow, almost like it's listening to late John Coltrane, I find that ideas start coming out a front in front of my habits, that new things emerge. And from that, I start to explore the unknown. And that's really what I'm talking about today. So, as always, you can reach out to me at jordanoconnor.com. And there's a, for the podcast, there's a tab there for podcasts and uh, contact page and so on. So, bye for now. <laughs>